So my name is Skip Grossman, and we're going to talk a little bit about management of cancer pain and whether there's a new way to deliver opiate drugs that might be helpful to patients. Um, <clears throat> I have a potential conflict of interest um, in that I was involved in the invention of this little device and I'm involved in the company that's trying to make this really happen. Uh, my goal for today is to talk a little bit about the importance of opiate in the management of cancer pain, but I would just remind you that the principles for which we use opiates for cancer pain are very similar to other pains, so a lot of what we're talking about is easily uh, thought of in terms of other, um, other painful conditions. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of opiates, some of the barriers to pain management, and then uh, focus a little bit on this uh, novel delivery mechanism. So in terms of just background information, about 70% of patients with cancer had pain that's severe enough to require opiates to, at some point during the course of their illness. If you sit down and talk to patients about what's going on with them, they realize that oftentimes as oncologists, we're not good enough to take away their cancer. So what they really ask us to do is to please make sure that their death is a comfortable death, and if it's a priority for the patients, then by definition it has to be a priority for us. In fact, we have many ways to be able to do a very good job for patients. Uh, we have excellent diagnostic tools so we can actually figure out um, where the pain is coming from. Oftentimes it's related to the tumor, sometimes it's also related to the treatment. Surgery is never any fun, radiation can cause pain, as can chemotherapy. There are all kinds of medicines that we have. There are non-opiate approaches, all kinds of drugs or blocks for treatment for neuropathic pain. And we have all kinds of opiates available to us. The common ones that you folks all know about are morphine and oxycodone, and fentanyl patches, but hydromorphone, the other name for that is the lauded, is also one that's frequently used. There are all kinds of routes that you can use to deliver opiates. I just got them listed here, but it's just about anything you could imagine from oral to rectal or under the skin, across the, under the tongue, across the skin, into the vein, into the subcutaneous tissue, or into the spine areas. Uh, and there are all kinds of ways to deliver it. There's immediate release, there's sustained release. There are now little computer chips, so there's patient control analgesia with lockout times and safety factors that are in there as well. And usually when we see patients, the first thing we do is we take short-acting drugs and we escalate them to find out whether this pain is opiate sensitive and what is the approximate dose that a patient would require. And then after that, the patients are often converted to a longer-acting drug because it's more convenient for patients. The compliance is better um, and oftentimes we have to think about the fact that uh, these drugs are a little bit more expensive than the immediate release drugs, although they really do the same thing except for convenience. So in terms of how to get these drugs in, uh, a big exclamation point, the oral route is the preferred route. So if you have a choice, this is the best way to give it. But as I mentioned, there are many other routes that can be used as well. Some of them, such as uh, discharging people with intravenous uh, medications, uh, require uh, some sort of a catheter, an external pump, some nursing oversight and you run into a lot of money and obviously the same is true for intraspinal opiates as well. So, yes? Uh, it's cheaper, it's easier, you can change the dose, it's less expensive, almost any way to look at it. If you have an oral route, that, that would be the best option. So, as a physician taking care of patients who've got cancer pain, uh, this would all suggest we should do a great job. Uh, we can identify where it is, we've got all kinds of mechanisms to be able to treat it, and drugs to treat it, but in fact it doesn't turn out to be quite so easy, and there are barriers that are on the patient end, and there are patients on the barriers on the healthcare provider end. So one of the barriers is that uh, pain is not something you can measure like blood pressure or blood sugar it requires that we talk about it. For example, you have no idea how much pain I'm in having to talk with you, and I have no idea how much pain you're in having to listen unless we actually communicate. And there are all kinds of reasons why patients don't talk about their pain. They've got cancer, they know it hurts, there's no big deal, there's no reason to, to um, 
uh, spend a lot of time with it. They wish uh, to appear strong, so when you come around to rounds in the morning and say, how are you doing? They say, fine. It's only if you start asking other questions you find out that they're far from fine. They want to believe that they're doing well, and they're afraid if they complain to you, you're going to order a scan, you're going to find out that the tumor's grown. They really don't want that information. Mm. They also believe that, in fact, uh, if they distract you from your oncologic job, that is shrinking your tumor, uh, then, you know, to take care of their pain, you may not get the tumor job done, and if they get the tumor job done, then the pain will get better. So they just leave you alone. And also they are concerned about the side effects of opiates. They know that this causes constipation, they know it causes uh, them to be sleepy or drowsy, they, they may get some nausea associated with it. They also read in the newspaper about drug addiction or people who suddenly get taken off their opiates. Now, in fact, addiction in this population is extremely rare, and we don't ever stop people with drugs, and the side effects we can usually take care of pretty well. But nevertheless, these are reasons why the communication may be an issue. On the physician side, we are generally very poorly trained in evaluation and management of pain, cancer pain in particular. And as Suzanne is going to tell you with the next talk, we lack some pretty important skills about uh, prescribing opiates. We do a great job in terms of things that are quantifiable, the size of the tumor, the height of your white count, et cetera, et cetera your temperature, but the subjective stuff we don't pay as much attention to. Although we do record pain scores in the literature because it's required. Uh, it's often not used very much. And physicians are also concerned about issues with regard to dependence, and tolerance, and addiction. And also, often, the fact that every prescription is recorded in a computer someplace. And there's a concern that maybe somebody's going to come by and talk to you about the fact that you're prescribing too many opioids. So if we just had to talk about what issues we would think are high priorities. Number one is this has to be up on the priority list of the physicians who are caring for the patients. If they don't really care about it, nothing's going to go well. You need to do pain assessment measurements. Often these are just visual analog scales or verbal reports from 0 to 10, where is your pain. You need to think about the etiology of cancer pain, because that really helps you in terms of how you treat the patient. You need to consider what treatments are available. Maybe radiation would be the right treatment. Maybe a nerve block, maybe some chemotherapy, maybe analgesics, maybe neuropathic medicines. But those all require that you know something about all of them. Uh, Suzanne's going to talk about opioid equivalency information. There are good guidelines that uh, allow you to be able to look up what you don't know. And last but not least, you have to think about the availability of opioids for your patients. And that sounds a little crazy. We talked a couple minutes ago about how many opioids were available. But if you live in the inner city, and the inner city pharmacies are not carrying opioids for obvious reasons, the patients can have trouble getting them if you prescribe. The more expensive opiates and the patients can't afford it, it's not going to happen. If people live in a household where uh, the grandmother says, you know, Johnny was a drug abuser and you're not going in this direction, you know, it's another story. Uh, and if you happen to live in a country which doesn't have a lot of uh, opioids, it's another, it's another issue altogether. So this is a real patient that we saw in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, running a pain seminar there, who had cervical cancer extending to the pelvic side walls. She had had surgery, she'd had radiation, she had chemotherapy. She had 10 out of 10 pain, as bad as it gets. It's been that way for three months. Um, she had uh, tried to get a nerve block, and it was ineffective, so she said goodbye to her husband and her two small kids. She got on a bus, she came over the mountains, came to the cancer center in this town and said, I'm not going back. She had never received a drop of morphine, not one drop. So she, there was no pain medicine available. The only thing she had is the equivalent of our uh, Tylenol, 